I'm so pleased to introduce Professor Christian Dagg. He is the head of the School of Architecture, Planning and Landscape Architecture at Auburn University. And you'll also see that he is a co-author for the concluding essay in the Renegades catalog that you all got. So you'll get to read some of his work. And he, we treasure him because he is really the expert on the work of Bob Faust, whose drawings you probably saw in the exhibition just now. And Faust is amazing, so make sure you get a good look at his drawings. Um, Christian Dagg is also a principal of Hinson and Dagg Architects. The firm has been recognized with AIA Design Awards at the local and state level for their attention to typology, materials, and innovative response to context. Christian is also an expert on the work of Bob Faust. Um, he is taught at the Boston Architectural Center, Northeast University, Northeastern University and Auburn University. And with Christian, I also want to uh, welcome back Hans Butzer, who is the co-chair for this session and who you've already met. So please help me welcome Christian and Hans. Great. Um, thank you all for having me here today. Um, uh, it's great to be here at the University of Oklahoma. And, uh, uh, you know, a little while ago, Hans and Stephanie and I, we discovered that uh, our two schools had a number of interesting connections. And I've been interested in the history of both our school and the history of design build, because, of course, uh, uh, part of our school is the rural studio, and understanding that history has been rather important to us. Um, but through this uh, interest in our school, we have been, uh, I have discovered a number of interesting things. The picture we saw earlier of Joseph Hudnut and uh, Walter Gropius. Joseph Hudnut was actually one of the first faculty members at the School of Architecture at Auburn University. He had studied at Michigan and came down to Auburn, I believe it was a form of penance from his uh, professors to come teach in Alabama, but he then made his way up to Columbia and the GSD after that. And then, of course, uh, again, based upon the, the last lecture we just saw, uh, our first dean, Fred Biggin, uh, had written a book on a uh, technical manual on stone cutting before he became the dean. We're 25 minutes away from Tuskegee. A lot of people go there for the Paul Rudolph, but you stay for the beautiful buildings built by the students, which, again, was referenced in an earlier uh, conversation. But in terms of this to uh, topic about engaging design build and pedagogy, uh, one of the things that's uh, been really interesting to me is that there is this trajectory of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright and the work of Taliesin through an architect by the name of Albert Ledner in New Orleans, and then also Bruce Goff and here with the School uh, of Architecture at the University of Oklahoma, where uh, the student uh, Bob Faust, who Stephanie just mentioned, um, was again a student here, studied under Goff, uh, worked for Albert Ledner, and then made his way to Auburn in the late 60s. He designed his own buildings in the spring semester and would hire students and build them in the summer uh, during the summer uh, uh, within the, uh, the city of Auburn. Samuel Mockby and D.K. Ruth, who were then uh, uh, co-founders of the Rural Studio, of course, were uh, students at Auburn at the time and uh, had uh, seen his work and were really familiar with it. Uh, and, of course, we have now just celebrated 25 years of design build education at the Rural Studio uh, just this last year. Um, so as we first started talking about this session, uh, Hans and I and Stephanie and Angela had lots of questions about just this history of design build and what constitutes the current thinking behind this as a pedagogical model. Uh, so, of course, we had questions about what the learning objectives were for the students, uh, who did the project serve in terms of the uh, whether it's the clients or the students themselves, and how do we establish some hierarchy in that type of uh, organization? Uh, are we trying to teach our students about the agency of architects and in many ways translate that into uh, developer or client roles? And then, uh, as we'll hear in some of, the session, uh, some of the papers this afternoon, how do we begin to extend that to develop some new knowledge or applied research in relationship to the design build activities of a lot of different uh, schools? And I know from my, uh, speaking uh, for myself, I know we are really interested in always trying to uh, be the best at getting better as far as design build education is concerned. Uh, we want our students to be part of the community and not just tourists showing up for a little while and leaving. And we want them to work with real people and we want them to certainly have some impact in the areas that they're uh, engaging. So along those lines, I want to turn it over quickly to our, uh, to our first speaker. Uh, Chris Trumbull is an associate professor and architect in the School of Architecture at the University of Arizona. Uh, and he is going to give a talk entitled Beyond the Build. So welcome, Chris. Yeah, this is a, a talk. 
apropos about uh, design-build pedagogy, but I have to say I've always been uncomfortable uh, with the moniker uh, design-build, and uh, it's got so many different, uh, I think, preconceptions. You know, sometimes if you're a design-build person, uh, you're the one who gets to wear uh, work boots and have concrete stains on your clothes, and sometimes people think you're a dumb hammer swinger, and uh, uh, sometimes we uh, we make glorious projects that that um, you know win awards and then fall apart 30 minutes after the uh, the pictures are taken. And uh, so I'd, I'd like to think, and I think most people who are engaged in so-called design build activities are really interested in architecture, and um, uh, it's just one vehicle of, uh, of studying, practicing, um, researching uh, architecture. Uh, just a, a little bit about uh, my background. Um, I, I had a fairly uh, conventional hypothetical uh, undergraduate education at the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana. And then I went to graduate school at the University of Pennsylvania, where I was uh, definitely introduced uh, to, I found my people, and, and they were makers. And uh, that's where I really developed a, a taste and, and the power and the, the belief in experiential learning, I will say, that was often, you know, craft-centric. Uh, uh, and uh, then I, I went on to the University of Arizona where I was hired as an uh, architect to reconceive of the structures curriculum. <clears throat> and uh, rather than having a laboratory exercise that was uh, demonstrative on the side, I inverted the model. So now computation served laboratory projects. And every two weeks, students would design and build a small uh, but full-scale uh, structures project, everything from eight-foot towers and cantilevers, laminating wood, steel, and just uh, working structural hypothesis after structural hypothesis, and amongst a large group of students, you run across every static structural phenomena uh, that exists. And it was in uh, 2010 that uh, I did my first design-build project. And... Um, I had been in New York City and found my way to Tucson, Arizona, and uh, when you look at the bus shelters out there, uh, it, it's not dignified to be a pedestrian in a decentralized uh, western city um, for the most part. And uh, you look at the bus shelters and people stand behind the bus shelters uh, to seek reprieve from the oppressive sun. And uh, uh, they miss the buses because they're standing behind buildings and standing behind bus shelters and standing behind trees. And that was really my motivation, was to go after uh, this uh, very important, I think, piece of infrastructure, this building typology. And when I embarked on that, I have to say I really didn't think that much, and being somebody who cares about pedagogy, about how to take a group of students through that process and deliver a performative product that everybody's happy with and is, and is going to work well. And uh, now I'm probably 12 projects in, and uh, this is uh, my most recent. So um, there are a lot of different interpretations uh, to, uh, to design build. And um, I, I see really kind of four core ingredients uh, that they all undertake, whether those are installations, furniture, building technology exercises, uh, that we've got uh, education, uh, we've got a research component, often a service component, and increasingly an engagement component. But I find the common common element is is reality. And I think it's so important that we move beyond our, our willful tendencies, our, our pure self-serving speculations. And, and, and when we temper our ideas uh, with the conditions of reality, uh, actually tempering is not the right word, we sharpen our ideas with those conditions. It's not about, uh, it's not about just dealing with reality, it's about uh, pushing through uh, with our vision. And uh, I consider uh, my, say, uh, design-build uh, pedagogy about uh, four uh, performance realms, uh, educary, pragmatism, collaboration, and, uh, and practice la uh, laboratory. And these are my, uh, my guiding principles. Many of you may be aware that educary is the Latin root for education. And uh, it does not mean uh, spoon feeding. Uh, it means to draw out, hence the image uh, demonstrating capillary action. And uh, of inspiration to me is Buckminster Fuller, shortly before his death, wrote, 
or uh, spoke rather, uh, I never try to tell anybody else what to do, number one. And number two, I think that's what the individual is all about. Each one of us has something to contribute. This really depends on each one doing their own thinking but not following any kind of rule that I can give out, any command. We're all on this frontier. We're all in a great mystery, incredibly mysterious. Each one possesses exactly what each one is working out, and what each one works out relates to their particular set of circumstances of any one day or any one place around the world. And uh, often in architecture schools, I see that we have a culture where we really play to the 1%. We play to the top performers. And that's, that's not my centroid. I like to play the breadth. I, I think that we need, we have more work to do in the everyday architecture than we do in the things that cover the magazines and the things that uh, are smeared across uh, Instagram. And uh, I like to think about the trajectory. I don't know if I have, oh, I'm not very good with one of these. I'm, I'm more of a screen rubber. I'm going to go in. Um, when we think about our students, our students have certain experiences that inform their trajectory before they get it, uh, before we get them. And then we have this very limited period where we're working with them for everywhere from four uh, to six years. And, and this is a very important period. But it's really about everything that happens after. And, and there are a lot of things going on in the, uh, in the profession of architecture, as you know. If, if I was going to say where, where the puck is going, uh, I, I think we're seeing an increase in demands for performance. We're seeing an increase in demands for collaboration. I'm not talking teamwork. And uh, we see increase in demands, as we uh, heard earlier, uh, about research. And I would say, first and foremost, about empirical, in the field, uh, research. So uh, I think we, we need to look at every student, and we need to think about what they can offer, even if they're not going to be on the cover of the magazine, because I think the heavy lifting uh, lies uh, outside of that realm. Secondly is pragmatism. And in the philosophical sense, I mean consequence, right? And, and this relates very much to performance. And um, I think I, I really focused on this when I was sitting at a review and a student was presenting a project and they said, I'm working with the idea of sunlight. And I thought, that is fascinating. What is that? The idea of sunlight. It's this colloquialism, right, that allows us to hold ourselves safely from reality. Sunlight is energy, sunlight is, is uh, vitamin D, uh, sunlight is warmth, sunlight is all of these things. And to simply say that I'm interested in the aesthetic light play, I don't think is where the puck is going. And, and I think all too often, and I say it too, the idea of, because it's so, it's so much more interesting to see something as expansive, larger than what it is. And I, I don't think we should eradicate that power of architecture, but I do think it's silly if we're always looking at it uh, with that, uh, that uh, perspective. And uh, next is uh, collaboration. And uh, like many of you, there used to be this uh, painting on the side of my high school uh, gymnasium that said there's no I in team. And I think <laughs> those people don't know anything about teamwork. And uh, because when we get to collaboration, and I, I like this, uh, there's an educational psychologist, I believe Swedish, Anders, who said that uh, collaboration is the construction of consensus through individual contribution. And if you can't get the individual to buy in and contribute to the team, you don't have a team. Right? This is just a bunch of people working side by side. And I think it's really dangerous that everybody is misusing the word collaboration. If you simply, if somebody else touched your project, they're a collaborator. I, th I think it's a disservice, and it is not uh, taking the, uh, the puck forward. And I use this Spencer Tunic image because these people are, in fact, collaborating. They're doing something together that they couldn't do as individuals, which is staging a climate protest, standing naked uh, in, uh, in cold weather. Uh, the fourth dimension, the fourth point, is practice laboratory. And as we go through a, a design build project, it's an opportunity for the students to get exposed to convention, but also start to question that convention. Because it is so important that when our students graduate, sometimes we, we paint these pictures, the profession has changed, it's all out there. But still, most of the time, it's a man who's calling the shots, who is going to tell a bunch of people what they need to do. They need to have the confidence, the values, and the vision to withstand those conditions and make the change once they do get the keys to the car. 
And just something about critical practice. We talk about critical practice, and I don't know if any of you at your uh, respective institutions claim the mantle of we are a critical practice school. And some people say, well, it just means we take practice more seriously than other schools. In fact, that's even on our, our school website, which I think is pretty silly. Um, but uh, uh, we've had a number of fora in, in our school trying to get to what is critical practice. And the consensus that has emerged is that uh, in order for the practice of architecture to be critical, it has to be informed by the conditions on the ground, be those social, people, or place, they have to be run through the silo of architecture, and then they have to result in an impact beyond the silo. And we've all been to too many presentations where we talk about grandiose plans that are going to go nowhere. They're just going to sit inside of the academy. And I think it's really important that we move forward and uh, implement uh, our ideas. All right, now some of the techniques that uh, we use let me see where I am, uh, in our project, and some of them are rather mundane. Um, one of the first things we do is establish a stakeholder diagram, and I'm sure many of you have done the same. Uh, this is about understanding every player. I hate when we have a project and somebody holds veto power, or there's some unknown entity. That is not the nature of practice. The nature of responsible practice is to define every single unknown that you can to minimize the unknowns that you have to deal with in a more tactical way in the delivery of a project. So the first thing we do is we identify every single player, their interest, and their responsibility in the project. And uh, this is the only time we've ever done a project. This is a, about a grid shell project that was done as part of a Thinking While Doing grant, an international a grant with many institutions, my colleague uh, Ted Cavanaugh and Claire Nicholas back there um, are uh, a, a part of the, the greater initiative here. But this is the, so we were dealing with a grid shell typology. I've never worked with a project where this was a, a, a given, where you actually know a structural system before you actually know the project that you're doing. Um, and uh, working with the students, we started to try and understand this grid shell, and we started to try and understand who we were as a team. And for the first time, we adopted a spirit animal, and so we became uh, Studio Pangolin. And uh, it seemed kind of silly at first, but it actually became a great identifier for the team. It ended up being spray painted on all of our materials. It moved on T-shirts. And uh, as far as forming that kind of cohesive group, I, I think about an orbit in a project, a design-build project. And, and as all the planets, the students, are spinning around that project, sometimes they tend to drift. And once they drift, you have a brief chance to bring them back in. Otherwise, you got to cut them loose. And if there's one thing you don't want to be, you do not want to be a planet with a number, a micro, whatever Pluto has become, way out on the periphery. And uh, this mechanism uh, is, uh, is very useful to uh, sorting the, uh, the planets. I want to say something about uh, performance realms, and this relates a little bit to the idea of comment. How often, I've, uh, so many times I've asked students, well, how do you make your project better? And it's, it's baffling, because in order to say, how do I make my project better, you have to be rather straightforward and finite about what your project is trying to do. And I think when we talk about performance and all the emphasis on performance, it's very easy to understand that in a quantitative sense. What is harder, all of the beauty, so much of the soul and power of architecture is beyond quantitative definition. So somehow we have to be able to merge this quantitative expectation and the qualitative. And so uh, we'll start off, in this case, I don't have a picture with me right now, we probably had 40 feet of butcher paper and we spent several days writing everything we need this, this project needed to do. It needed to win an award. It needed to uh, provide shade. It needed to, I don't know, be a good place for people to cry when their reviews didn't go well. It needed to do all of these things. And, and so we started, and, and when you have 100 performance criteria or maybe 300 performance criteria, you can't work with those very well. So we moved from 40 feet and several hundred performance criteria down to these four. And I will say, Performance criteria, in, in my context, unfortunately, is always a Camry. If you have one, you're driving a Formula One sports car. One idea, that's it. 
If you have too many, you're in the cargo van. So three to five is the sweet spot. Everybody drives a Camry. And when we go through this process, for example, comfort, I listed these four performance criteria, walk the walk, really represents uh, our, our cynical perception of our college. I'm always uncomfortable when these things are recorded. Uh, is that you know, we were claiming to be the, uh, the leader in uh, Arab design in the universe. And we thought it was a great claim, but we didn't think it was accurate. And when you talk to the students, you talk to the faculty, it may be on our website, but it might not be there. So we really wanted that authenticity, and that, that became Walk the Walk. Nexus, we were building right next to this very busy, the busiest access point to, ca uh, to campus. And we wanted to be able to tap into that energy, so that was essential for us. And comfort and scape. We did not want to have a building that was not connected to its landscape. We wanted it to be one. So when we took something like comfort and say, get, get, get a diagrammatic image, and by this I mean something that is both reductive and expansive, something that can allow you to connect the quantitative performance criteria and the qualitative performance criteria. And this inevitably is the first image that somebody produced. You Google comfort, and you find a pillow, and a woman holding the pillow. That's not going to be very useful as you move forward in design. So we started working forward. And this is a photo by, uh, uh, let's mess his name up, Gregory uh, Krugson. And uh, this was several steps in the process. But this gave us a more sophisticated, more nuanced understanding of what comfort was. Here we have this kind of 1960s uh, environment. We have a, a woman lying naked. And then through the windows, we see a very extreme, oppressive, cold environment. So this starts to allow us uh, to, to see the context of comfort. Right? If, we, if we had a sunny beach and a corona ad through those windows, her being naked would not nearly have the, the value. Right? To have those kinds of oppressive forces juxtaposed with that kind of comfort really started to add the value to comfort. These are some other proposals, a little more finite. Ice fishing shelter, a lizard, where we come from. Lizards, very common. Lizards, how do they find comfort as cold-blooded animals? They do push-ups. They go into the shade. And um, let's see here. All right. Now on to uh, some, some uh, different uh, mechanisms. When we are uh, working on design, uh, we never use a competitive process. A competitive process is very much about alienating all of the contributors. So we like to think of design as a hypothesis. And the first round of design is simply about identifying positive qualities and identifying negatives. Right? And then we go to another round. And we work. Everybody's free to work with all of those positives and exclude all of those negatives, introduce new ideas. And after three to five rounds, all of a sudden, you've got a design that belongs to nobody. It belongs to everybody. Everybody's got buy-in. And uh, this is a backdrop uh, just to talk about this point. And it's as much about figuring out what the design is not as it is about figuring out what the design is. And so we, in our grid shell uh, design process, this is a small fraction. There's actually a board um, with uh, well over 100 uh, different versions that uh, that we modeled. Um, you've all used a schedule. And uh, when you use a schedule in a design build project, I guess it's one thing to have a schedule. First you have a schedule. And then you have to learn to use the schedule. And we've tried Google Docs. We've tried uh, everybody has their own schedule. And uh, the war room has really proved to be the only solution. And we've had schedules that are eight feet high, 12 feet wide, and they are meant to be uh, drawn on, they're meant to be used, and then they're reprinted every week. And I found that to be the only way to really get people to work with a schedule. And that really goes into what I call the VLF, the Very Large Format War Room, where we have all of these diagrams. Uh, so uh, this on the, on the left is a retrospective of all the different activities that every member of the studio did during the design semester. So they can go back and see how they've touched all these different aspects of the project, that they've been leaders of something, followers in others. And this is just an example of a meeting minute, 
When we have a meeting, we actually have a pre-meeting. We say, who are the players? What are their interests? What are their responsibilities? What do we want from them? What is our job? And every time, we take notes. And we remember what every single person said. And we make a point of mentioning something that every one of those people said because you, you will lose them if you don't. And that's, that's a very pragmatic thing, but it's about building that consensus and building that trust and then delivering on that. Another mechanism, shop drawings. So often we just say we need to do something and we run at it. Some of my students hate me for some of these activities because they just want to do it. Um, so when we say that, uh, oh, we're going we're gonna to get something uh, fabricated, what are all the forces that will affect when that thing is actually going to come and be installed? We have design coordination, we have budgets, we have schedule, uh, we have uh, engineering coordinations uh, in this project, we have facilities management, planning, design and construction, risk management, all these different players had to get their hands, give their oversight, be consulted in advance, give approval. So every component, or at least primary components, they had to develop, develop a diagram like this so they could get in front of when decisions needed to be made and uh, keep things moving. We always prototype everything. Uh, we did not prototype demolition, and I regret that we did not prototype dem demolition because there are points where we modified existing concrete, and I think we should have done some practice cuts because I walk by it every day as I go in, and uh, I wish that we had practiced that a little bit better. And this is a construction delivery coordination diagram. And when we have a construction event, we actually sit down and have a meeting before that. We figure out who does what. How many people are working vibrators? How many people are working hammers on a concrete pour? And when stuff goes south, who's in charge of where the wheelbarrows are and the shovels? And who's going to be staying late to shovel all that concrete? Got to have all that stuff figured out. And then after the pour, we have another meeting that says, where's the near miss? Where did it almost go wrong? And then uh, another component, and something I am certain most of my students hate me for, is uh, every two weeks we have a collaborative evaluation where every student evaluates every other student and me. And the intention there is to optimize our performance in the team. They hated it first, they respect it in the end, and it has saved the team and saved the project on council's occasions. Because there'll be animosities building between one group here and another group is off-site working on gl uh, glass fiber reinforced concrete panels and they don't think they're doing anything yet, then they're gonna, they're gonna come back. All of this energy is something that needs to be managed. Uh, when you get somebody who doesn't like the way everybody swears and makes sexual innuendos on the construction site, but they don't say anything, this is a way for me to know that these things are going down and I can manage that kind of morale. And uh, that has been a, a very time consuming but a very fascinating exercise. When you get written records of what's going on in everybody's mind and you see how that evolves over the course of the project. Now I'd like to uh, just, since I'm talking about the project, I feel like I at least have to show it. Uh, this is a grid shell structure, a sprung grid shell. Uh, this is in front of our uh, uh, College of Architecture, uh, Planning, and Landscape Architecture in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, we did all the landscape. Uh, we did all the concrete. Our students were certified uh, to weld, so all the structural welding. Um, this is the uh, basic layout of it. We've got a small retention basin from watershed off the parking lot in the rear. We've got the pavilion. We've got uh, some accessible paths, we've got these soapboxes, plants, all sorts of uh, little details. Uh, this is the process of lifting the shell, jiffy pop, if you will. And uh, when we first lifted this, something was wrong. We had the meeting beforehand, everything looked like it went well, but it did not rest correctly. And then uh, we had a meeting after, and we figured out that somebody misnumbered one set of numbers on the shop drawing. And so the whole thing was one cell off. So we had to deflate it, move everything one bay over, which meant retying a lot of rods before we lifted it up uh, again. Uh, there's our uh, perforated steel, uh, movable soap boxes. We've got night lighting and a whole bunch of details. Fortunately, the most recognition that this project gets is because uh, on our local news, people started texting me and saying, hey, your project's on the news. They didn't care about the project. They cared about Han Solo 
who was cast on a whim uh, inside one of our concrete walls. So I thought that was, uh, thought that was funny. All right, and then it really comes down in the end is, is that, that use. We built a great team, and I used to have anxiety about whether the projects are going to come out good or not. And then once I figured if you put all that energy in the team, in that collaboration, great, perfect, um, then it's going to work. I actually believe it's guaranteed to work as long as you get out front, identify those forces that are going to bring it down, build that team. And these, I think, are the skills that our, our future architects need to have, is that we need to, in order to conquer performance and in order to conquer research and, and deliver better projects, the business trifecta of faster, better, cheaper, and let's even throw in more profitable, that is absolutely going to be the way forward. And this was just a group of kids that started to uh, uh, nearly kill themselves uh, with these movable uh, soap block uh, benches. But uh, watching people come and play music underneath this thing, watching kids walk across the, the, the walls and their parents following them and seeing a drunk guy spin around on the inside and telling his girlfriend that that's his favorite place. You know, that's, that's the magic that we all feel uh, really good about. And um, so it's not so much about the build. I'd really like to think about it. It's, it's about architecture, and it's about that in, in my sense. And I'm just one voice. I'm not saying this is how things should be. I'm just one guy in a great pl pluralistic soup that, that makes architecture absolutely uh, fascinating. So there you have it. Thank you. presentation. Uh, let me introduce the next speaker. Uh, Ted Cavanaugh is a professor at Dalhousie University. Um, he's the founder of Design Build Exchange uh, for North America and Europe. I was going to say, uh, uh, previously I mentioned to him that last time I think uh, I saw him, our roles were reversed. He was the session chair for an ACSA session. Um, uh, and uh, he's going to deliver a talk called Theory and Design Build. We'll give you a chance to swap over here. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, enjoy seeing Oklahoma for my second time. I think I was here once to see the Price Tower, so I haven't been to this neck of the woods. Um, and and I've worked with Chris for quite a while. We we did the grid shell projects together, and uh, I wanted to uh, talk to you a little bit about them, but mostly I wanted to talk to you about where we are now in in the projects, and and raise a kind of question that is in the air of this conference, which is about research. And it seems to be that there are different types of research that are ongoing, and the design build has to come to terms with what sorts or how many different types of research design build is about. And what I'm going to talk about is, is the whole issue about um, that relates a little bit to my background. I have a PhD in the history of technology and uh, uh, science technology studies, and I'm particularly interested in the relationship of the social to the technological, because I think they're in, inextricably inter intertwined, and I think there's a lot to be learned about how those two, how that field can actually impact on what we do. Um, so Chris was asking why we started with an idea about a certain technology. That's part of the reason. And the other part of the, part of the reason is that it's, it was a comparative project, and we built four, four of these grid shells, and we have huge amounts of data and collaboration that we're trying to deal with now and trying to deal with after, after the fact. Uh, so let me just start by framing it very simply. Uh, Jane Anderson, who's a design-build practitioner in England, uh, in her writings on what they call live projects, uh, has assessed, based on her live project website uh, and network, that when she went through and assessed it, she realized that the majority of design-build projects are done on a case study methodology, and they're authored by the academics who initiated them. So already there, you can see that that's a limited set of, re of ways of reporting on design-build projects. And it's that, I think, that we have to come to terms with. Um, and also this other idea about the projects are a combination of the social and the technical. So 
i'll just go briefly through some of the projects that we did i'm just going to show a slide of each but just give you a sense of the kind of last ten years that we've been working on these things we've been doing design build in in dalhousie since ninety ninety one but the particular aspects of the more recent projects that we've been working on are the lamella structure that heavily influenced by rural studios lamellas that we went down to see lamellas uh, project that we did in twenty ten um, the timbrel vault, the brick vault that we did in 2012. You can see a kind of tendency here about vaults and vaults that are getting a little bit more differentiated. The first of the grid shell series that we did in Nova Scotia in 2014. Uh, the one that, that we had our collaborator designed uh, in Louisiana Lafayette, Jeff Jertson, who did it in 2015. Chris's uh, uh, grid shell that, that happened in 2016. Many of these projects lasted more than one year. And the, the last project that we did in 2018, that's in, uh, back in Nova Scotia, and was a collaboration of all the schools that got back together to do it again. And the book that talks about the grid shells that came out last summer uh, from uh, Burkhauser. Uh, it's quite a nice book. But the interesting thing about the book and the, and the team that we developed for the project is that we weren't just architects. And so here you see, I think Claire is in the room, is in, hidden behind the scaffolding here. But uh, Claire's an anthropologist and uh, Arlene, who's a sociologist. And that's what I mean by having reams of data. We had huge amounts of data of these people that are actually studying the way that we did things. And so through conversations and that sort of thing, we 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 started to realize that we were coming to we were working on different time scales i mean we we had naively gone into the projects and expected feedback from the anthropologists and sociologists about how to improve or how to feedback in terms of what we were doing in fact we realized we had a bigger problem on our hands that we actually didn't really know what they were talking about they didn't know what we were talking about and yet we had things to contribute to each other so since that time i've spent a lot of time reading uh, social theory, particular actor network theory. And so this talk is just to show you that there's some, there's some potential in the relationship between social theory that's out there, people are studying architecture that, aren't, that isn't involving architects, and that maybe we should spend it, pay some attention to what they're talking about, because they're talking about the things that we work on uh, and, and produce. And, and there might be a way of using design build to actually facilitate this way of thinking about uh, understanding how technology and social issues come together, how the material contacts the social. So the, the paper is outlined in this way. Um, it talks about material, ter material turn in research. I'll, I'll go briefly into each of these issues, uh, that both the technological and the social matter Assessing the socio-political context, assessing the socio-political process, the reiterative process of design use, the reiterative process of design construct, uh, and then two anecdotes that, that are kind of things that we learned uh, that were in my mind things that I discovered that are complex things that we tried to understand. When we were dealing with wood in our grid shells, the wood was actually an active participant, and how do you describe that? Um, and then ideas of, about jigs. Jigs are an interesting hybrid between something that is uh, designed, but it's designed to construct. So there's this kind of interesting place that a jig finds itself in the process of design build uh, in, in our case. So the material return turn in research is something that was identified in 2013. I'm sure it's been identified previously. But there was a group of thinkers at the JAE who came up with this design frameworks and framed design into a particular situation within research pedagogy in, in architecture. And I think it's worth going back and looking at that article because they identify what we're doing as something very particular, uh, that it's design conflated with construction as a way of working. Uh, okay, you can have issues with the way it's written. The communicative realm of representation gives way to the efficacy of the built artifact. 
and the a posteriori documentation of its construction and occupation. Well, these are, I don't think there was a design build academic amongst the, these people that were talking about research, but I think there's an interesting point of departure here that could be perhaps challenged in, in several ways. And one of the people that I'm quite influenced by now, we had her to our final review of the projects that came together, uh, and she gave some really insightful comments about what we were doing, is Albina Yaneva, who teaches at the School of Architecture in Manchester. For those of you, I don't know how many of you know about actor net worth theory, but she's an important figure in that realm, and she teaches in a School of Architecture, so it's quite interesting. And this is something that reminds me of something Klaus Oldenburg said, but uh, she did this based on a, a three-year ethnographic study of o OMA, the, the office, uh, that where she studied them as an ethnographer and she tried to understand how architects were working. And she said, matter is much too multidimensional, much too active, complex, surprising, and counterintuitive to be represented in stabilized drawing artifacts or technical design drawings and charts. And I think that's what we're grappling with. That's the kind of stuff that we're dealing with. It's it's. It's what architecture is about, and in, in a way, design build is a kind of microcosm or potentially controlled environment in which we can try and understand these aspects of architecture and try and deal with it in a, in a, on a kind of theoretical basis. So I have been learning as fast as I can about actor network theory because I think there's an interesting relationship between that and what we're doing. So I'm coming at this on the fly, as it were, I'm sort of trying to understand it, uh, having come, having come, trying to come to terms with how to deal with these four projects that we initially set out to have a kind of strong comparative link between them that is, in fact, fairly tenuous right now, but there's lots of data that we can actually develop to make those connections possible. Um, so, so this is just some of the background about equity network theory. I probably don't need to go in it because you all know something about it. Um, but it's interesting to me that Bruno Latour starts his, his the whole actor network theory starts with a book that studies Louis Kahn's Salk Institute. Already, there's some real affinity between actor network theory and what we're what we're doing. And then I talked about before about Albania Yaneva's ethnographic study of the OMA. Uh, and and I, in, the, in the past two years, I've given this course five times, I think, about to do it on my sixth time. I've been sort of fast-tracking a course to try and learn as much as I can about actor network theory and, and how it might apply to architecture. So we've introduced this course in the graduate program about social theory and architecture, and it's really just my way of working with students to try and understand how the overlaps might happen. And it's amazing what you can do with a group of students. And actually, over the course of the, these, these uh, two and a half years, it's influenced the school tremendously because all of a sudden there's, act, there's a group that's actively working on theory that's based to something very material. So it's starting to influence the thesis projects in the school and that sort of thing. Um, so I think a lot of us teach design, build, and one other thing, or two other things, and so it's interesting that this course in theory has developed that. Uh, and the in the in the green t in the green text below it, there are sort of conceptual understandings that that come out of this field that I find really interesting. Closure, for those of you who might know a little bit about this theory, is is actually what inventions are, are framed as. It, like inventions are not an opening up, they're a shutting down. So it's in, already you start to reconceive what, in, what, what inventions are. They're kind of social agreements to everybody's gonna do certain, something in a certain way. So what's normally thought of as an invention as an opening up is actually a closing down. But it actually reinforces this idea about, about how social uh, theoreticians are starting to look at things in a way that we might not have thought about them in the past and that might help us in kind of framing what it is that we do. 
So there's closure. All these things have kind of theoretical background in, to them. So the subtext here is uh, interpretive flexibility, what that means, radically non-reductive theory, uh, anti-determinist theory. Um, champions, when you're talking about the social political context, and Stephen Moore's written a really good book on that, on the con terms of the eco farm in, in uh, Laredo, Texas, which shows you that, in fact, there are various forces, that networks that come together in terms of how to deal with these uh, uh, design-build projects. So there are champions, there's sellers, there's bystanders, there's various social groups, there's non-human actors, there's networks being aligned. So uh, uh, one of the things that starts to look at uh, how technology is, is involved in social issues in terms of the social-political process is Michel Callan's work on the um, elements of sociology of translation. And by translation, he, he talk, he's talking here about a process of developing technology as a translation process. All these things are, are quite complex, but then when you start to realize that there's a whole set of people that are actually writing about this in different ways, trying to understand and come to terms with these issues, I think there is an, an important overlap here happening between what it is that we do and what it is that the social theorists are working on. Um, so I'll just go quickly. So what I've excerpted from the paper is actually these the subtext here where we're dealing with, the process, in this case, the process of design use, which has a lot of things related to public interest design uh, what social theories call, the Latour called use before use, which is an interesting way of framing it, I think. Design after design. Uh, then there's a whole set of theories that are developing around the problem of our time, which is one of unstable building types. Everything wants to be a cafe, um, and we no longer have banks. This kind of issue. Uh, is actually being talked about in a relationship of theory to technology and how buildings are actually enacted rather than than static objects and so the the process emphasis in terms of what the what they're theorizing is i think really influential and i find that somewhat i find that understandable from from the way the things that it is that we do but I wanted also to show you that, in fact, there's huge numbers of references here. Here are just the excerpts of the footnotes from the paper. That there are people, that, and this is just on public pub, um, part, participatory design. So these are people that are, that are writing on this and developing social theory in relationship to it. And again, uh, it goes on to the this actual construction uh, that's happening in the field. And here we're trying to come to terms with the, what the activity is on site and how to theorize about this activity. Um, and so some of the terms that are developing here that have developed some definitional quality is this idea of scripting, that an object itself has a script that is basically the intentions of the thing itself. And so this idea of scripting and intentionality is an interesting thing about power and relationship between the designer and the user. And so when our students are actually out there constructing things, they're actually conflating this whole idea of the, of the, the designer and the constructor and the designer and the user in this way. The scripts that they've developed in their design projects actually don't script out very well on the construction site, and yet overall the project they're doing has an intentionality to it, a scripting to it, that that we can try and understand by analyzing it and trying to take it apart. And through this taking it apart, we can try and understand how we can do this thing better and how we can understand actually the way that we're working. So Madeleine Eckrick, for instance, uses the term script as a metaphor for the instruction manual. She claims that it's inscribed in every, in every artifact. Um, 
This applies to the design of buildings as much as the design of things that are parts of buildings. Furthermore, it applies to the tools of construction and to the construction process. Both the building and the building under construction are similar to the laboratories that the, the social science have studied. Uh, that particular arrangements of apparatus can have a vital significance for the production of useful inscription. This is, these are things that we understand when we're programming a building, but using this kind of language is an interesting way of, of actually seeing it afresh, I think. That's my, that's my view anyway. So just a couple of anecdotes. And so when I'm talking about wood as an actor, so one of the principles of actor network theory is that in fact non-humans and humans act in a network together. Uh, so buildings are non-humans. But, and, 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 and we think of buildings as almost live things, or really live things, that are interacting on a, on a kind of equal basis between the thing and, 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 and the, then the human. So if you start to think of networks of, of things as much as networks of people, there's an interesting relationship that starts to happen. In our case, one of the things that we learned about the wood itself and this was done in the first grid shell, and this is a drawing from the first grid shell. We have this idea of in, in uh, architecture about modeling. And models are really important. In fact, Yen, uh, Albina Yaneva has written a really interesting article on scaling up and scaling down as part of the architectural process. And, and what she's talking about is various ways of modeling things, various ways of modeling in a kind of reiterative way and another concept in this field is talked about black boxing, where you can black box something and hold it aside for a minute and then, and then continue to work around it, work with it as a black box, and then you can get into the black box and try and understand it. So there's a kind of try, a potential understanding of, of how processes work. And this, the, the drawing that you see on the screen right now is of the four, there are actually four models in here, four computer models of the project. And the project uh, had an architectural model in, in uh, Rhino. The, uh, the project had a structural model in Rhino. Uh, the project had a survey model, and we had survey equipment that, that uh, surveyed the the nodes of the grid shell and laid it out in a computer model in Rhino. And for a long time, for a while we were negotiating between the architectural model and the structural model. But we we're trying to do it on site as the building had already been built and erected and we we're trying to modify it in, in a particular direction. So the model, the structural model was obviously the ideal model. It used minimal materials. So we kept on trying to push the existing building on the site to the structural model and it kept on springing back on us. The wood laths, these 60, 60, 70 foot long wood laths kept on springing back in a particular position. The wood told us that in fact we had gotten something wrong. We spent about two, three weeks trying to force it into this ideal structural model. And the survey model then showed us that in fact somebody had made a mistake in laying out the grid, grid shell on the back edge of the connections and it was a full meter out. So we then made a decision that we were going to correct it, rebuild it based on spacing it out, the back out properly because if we didn't do that, we would actually have to add more material to the building. We'd have to beef up the structure because it wasn't meeting the ideal structural model. So the, the feedback here was that the wood had generated this, this, uh, this idea of it. Okay, so I've just been told I've got a minute left. So we also, when I talked a bit about the jig, jigs, um, the, the whole activity of trying to put a very repetitive process into a kind of manufacturing way, we tried to learn about that. So. Let me just conclude by talking about um, some of the things that that um, there are ways of looking at 
at programming of buildings, of, of actually doing things, designing things that can be influenced by actor network theory. And here's some of the things that, as I'm starting to go through a kind of process and reading backwards into it and trying to understand how you have discussions with students about the, the process of putting a building together and understanding how people use buildings, that this kind of feedback mechanism can actually influence the way that you would build buildings. And here are kind of the first nine principles that they're almost like things are going to happen. They're not exactly rules, but they're kind of operations that, that are a result of trying to understand things through this theoretical lens. So programming should be reconsidered to include things that are designed, such as building components, equipment, building systems, as participants, not as neutral observe services. Programming should also include natural processes. This seems a very logical thing, so some of these things are very straightforward, but in fact, thinking about them in this way develops a new understanding of that. So I'd just like to leave you with this question. What are the pedagogical implications of the practice-based research mod mod module in design-build? I think design-build programs are taking on more and more accreditation criteria. Uh, should we be doing this, or in fact, is this actually an additional load that we shouldn't be doing? What happens when you add research into the design-build model? Is it a practice-based research model, or can it also be, can it also involve social theory? Uh, and so, of course, I believe it can, and so I think that develops an, an idea about that ans, asks this, the same question again, which to say, what, it, what would, you, if you're adding things into the design build re, model of teaching new requirements into it, and then you're adding research into it, then you're adding the idea that it can, kind of can develop work with social theory into it, uh, maybe we're adding too much and too much pressure onto the design build way of teaching. Or maybe the entire school should be a design-build school, and we can teach every course from that point of view. Thanks. All right. Uh, for the last paper for this session, uh, Mackenzie Stagg will be, uh, she's coming up here at the moment. Um, so uh, there, there were four papers on the uh, uh, in the program. Michelle Pannon from Marywood University wasn't able to be with us today, so we'll move to uh, to Mackenzie's here, and I think we're right here. Yeah, great. Um, so just to introduce Mackenzie, uh, Mackenzie is an assistant research professor at Auburn University. Uh, she's been studying housing affordability and building technology, and she's the principal investigator of a number of uh, grants that we have associated with what we're calling the 20K initiative, or was called 20K initiative, is now the Front Porch Initiative. She'll be giving a talk from project to project, the opportunities and challenges of place-based research. Hi, good afternoon. Um, uh, as Christian said, I am in a, uh, what Auburn is considering a research uh, role with, uh, with Rural Studio. And, and, and the thing, I always struggle to not give a history lesson when we talk about Rural Studio. I'm going to really try hard not to do that today and to talk about one piece of one thing that we're, that we're doing. So, um, you know, Rural Studio is an off-campus off uh, piece of Auburn's uh, program of architecture. Auburn had a uh, five-year uh, program of architecture and their opportunities in the, we've messed with, around with it over the years, but currently in the third year uh, and the fifth year of study in the architecture school to come out to Rural Studio. And recently we've also added a, uh, a Master's of Science in Architecture in a public design, uh, public interest design uh, option. Uh, so at Rural Studio, we're based about two and a half hours away from main campus in Auburn. And so in some ways, it's kind of like a study abroad. The students move to West Alabama, um, and it's a you know, place-based uh, course of study. And so we essentially operate in a 25-mile radius 
around our home base of New Bern in predominantly three counties in West Alabama, Hale, Perry, and Marengo. And we do a, a range of work, and, and I'm going to show a clip briefly through some of the work that I'm otherwise not going to talk about today. Um, but, you know, we're trying to address the insecurities uh, we see in these communities. So we do things like engage in civic services through a firehouse or a town hall, uh, address education, um, through projects like Newburn Library or an after-school program uh, with Boys and Girls Club in Greensboro, uh, address health and well-being in our communities, like this courtyard for Hale County Hospital, which interestingly we're actually redoing uh, right now this year. Uh, things like public parks and what that, what the role of a public park is in a rural place, and also uh, food access, both in our own. Uh, area, uh, our own campus uh, in West Alabama, and also uh, with the community uh, interfacing with food. Uh, but, you know, the studio got its start uh, with with housing, and when we first start with housing, you know, this is built in 1993, the first two rural studio projects in this picture of the house and the smokehouse. It wasn't actually around ideas of affordability. It was an acknowledgement that good housing isn't affordable and people deserve it anyway. And so the first projects were really around that. Uh, you know, they had a known client and a known site. They were reflective, or when they were successful, they were reflective of their climactic and sociocultural contexts. Um, and they also, many of them explored uh, materials and essentially assigning value out of a valueless material. And, and some people called this sustainability, but in some ways I think we would argue this is a lower form of sustainability because you're, yet again, you're assigning a value to the material. Um, and through this development of these client houses, there were some big themes or lessons learned uh, that emerged. So, you know, the houses always focus on durability. Many of them have this kind of big roof and are raised up to uh, protect from the water um, the bugs. Um, you know, they, they work to extend the shoulder seasons passively uh, to allow for more efficient operation. And uh, they really tried to, in some cases, wisely uh, use resources and have uh, integrate elements that could do more than one thing for the for the project. Uh, and after doing that for a number of years, uh, we, we were thinking about the land-grant mission of Auburn University, which is a public university, and wondering uh, if there was more impact that we could have uh, through the resources we were bringing to the community with the school. Um, and so we began exploring what we originally called the 20K house. And yet again, just to briefly clip on this, the idea originally was it, a house, it was a house you could build for $20,000. We are not building a house for $20,000. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later. But the idea over the next, uh, I guess it's been, this is year 16, was to develop a series of prototypes uh, uh, that you could uh, iterate on uh, each year. Um, and, and throughout the years, too, we, we always talk about that we may not be smart because, you know, public university, but we are persistent. So, you know, I think in the beginning we thought we were going to come to this one house, and the one house was going to solve everything. But over the years we've learned that that's, that's not actually what we're trying to do. Um, and instead we can develop a product line of houses that to try to address uh, different need. So particularly today, I'm going to focus on the work of our third-year students and our graduate students because they're the ones who are currently undertaking this housing affordability research. And what they're doing through this research is really creating a feedback loop whereby the graduate students do a comprehensive project, they develop a full new prototype, and then the third years will take one of those prototypes, apply it directly to a client, and figure out what kind of modifications or variations to make uh, with that client. So kind of going back to the original spirit of working with a client from the beginning of the project. So to start out with uh, the graduate program, uh, this is uh, this was kind of an outgrowth of what we used to have as an outreach program. And so typically, this is how a team looks three or four people, um, and here and we see Joanne, who is her client at the end, but they do not meet her at the beginning of the project. And uh, they develop their project by looking in aggregate at local needs. So they do not have a client at the beginning of the project. They look at the work that's been done before. They look at things like census data, and they come up with a pro forma around uh, what they conclude from that. They also look at the work that's been done before, the, the one of the values of being in a place and staying in a place is we go back and we see how things age, what has worked, what hasn't worked, and continue to integrate that into the projects. And then out of that, they come up with their kind of design brief for what they're going to look at uh, in their house. And so uh, one of the emerge, emerging ideas here was this idea of a product line, so not trying to make a better house, 
than was done the previous year, but trying to make a different house. So looking at, uh, for example, which uh, how the house would approach the street on a sightless, you know, this is a sightless project, so how could it be flexible for the sites? What's the relation of the interior rooms? Are they more in, in one space? Are they divided into rooms, or is there some hybrid uh, in between? Uh, this particular uh, project that we're looking here uh, at as an example, um, they took on this idea of doing a square house to maximize the floor area relative uh, to the perimeter uh, around the house. Um, and they also tried to look at how that would work with the other houses that had already been developed uh, prior to the year. Um, and so they come up with this design of the house, and it is a comprehensive uh, design that is more broad than it is deep in some ways. Um, and, and, it's, and since it's a comprehensive project, you know, they go through and they work with consultants. Uh, they understand project management uh, from, from an, a kind of a practice sense of architecture. Uh, and they also understand uh, construction man management, sequencing, uh, management of materials, et cetera, and to the development of a home. And this home is given to a member of the community. Uh, so a client is selected during the design process for a uh, the, the, essentially the client is, uh, it's a spec house, so you find a client that fits with uh, what the project design is. And here's the, the final version of Joanne uh, once she's moved into her house. <laughs> so then the third years, they take those prototypes and they kind of invert it. So they have a client uh, from day one, and I should say uh, this is a typical third year class here. So many more students all working on one project. This is literally half of the people who've worked on this project because it's a two semester project, so a different group in the fall uh, than in the spring. And so on day one, they meet their clients. So for the purposes of this, it's uh, this particular house, uh, it is uh, Ophelia. Um, and what they do to begin is, is study the home she's living in. So we typically build uh, for clients who already have a house, but the house is uh, substandard. Even though it's a substandard house, there are many things that we can learn from the way that she's living in her house um, and the way the house has evolved over the years. So they do things like studies of the furniture and the arrangement of the spaces. They also know they're going to move her into a new house, so they assess what's going to move uh, with her, how much storage she has, how much um, furniture pieces, how much built-in storage do they need versus she already has the furniture and she would just like to place it in the house. Uh, they also do a site analysis. We build on the property that our clients already own. So we're typically sh keeping the person in their house while we build, and then we're moving them uh, to the new house on their property. And so we, we have these, you know, we're in a very rural condition, and typically the site parcels are fairly large, and that gives us the ability to do it. Uh, but in uh, Ophelia's house, even though the site looks large, when you start to overlay all the systems on the site, you realize you have a relatively constricted uh, buildable area. So then they use this analysis of what the client needs and the space she has to dis determine which of the prototypes would be a best fit uh, for that client. So yet again, based on this research they've done on the site, they come up with their uh, design brief uh, for the project. One of the things that was interesting about um, Ophelia is she has a couple of grown sons, and through the analysis of how she was living in her house, they noticed they, there was a day bed in the living room that seemed to be used. And one of her sons occasionally comes and visits her and sometimes stays for an extended period of time. And so they have an interesting way that they uh, use the house that has now affected the way that the plan has changed. Uh, so they look at, so this in this instance, they took three of the prototypes. We always named them after the first person we built them for. So it's Dave's, Max, and Joanne's. Um, and they assess what would fit on the site. They were pretty uh, immediately able to eliminate Dave's home because it did not fit in the buildable area. So then they took Joanne's and Max and looked at further developments that would work uh, for what she needed to live in the house. So they already knew they were going to make some manipulations to the floor plan to accommodate this idea that of a semi-long-term guest and how it folds uh, into the house through a sleeping nook that's, in the, that's doubled in the living space. Um, and uh, they actually, uh, after an analysis of that and the way it fit on the site, they decided to go with the Joanne's House model. So here you can see the comparison of the original prototype on the left to the modifications on the right. The other thing I don't have a slide of in this presentation is they also look at changes uh, to the envelope. So as where as the fifth years go broad, or the graduate program goes broad, the third years go deep through a few uh, predetermined and specific 
um, or I should say project determined in specific areas. So they did a lot of work around the foundation system for this house because uh, whereas we typically have fairly flat sites, they were on a, uh, uh, a slope site in this scenario. So over the years as we've done this, we've developed um, both the original prototypes and a series of modifications uh, or variations to the homes. And so what I'm tasked with doing as a researcher uh, at Auburn University is taking those products and that applied research of Rural Studio and synthesizing it into what we call the Front Porch Initiative, which is the externalizing of the work. So we get the prototypes from the graduate students, we get the variations from the third years, and then what we're doing is taking that research from, with our local client and we're offering it out to housing providers and their clients. So we're trying to extend the impact of the research beyond our service area in West Alabama. Uh, of all the houses that we have designed so far, there's really four that we're working forward with right now as prototypes. It's Dave's, Max, Joanne's, and Buster's. And some of this is part of a uh, really just a, a resources right now. We needed somewhere uh, to start. So we hope to expand to include more models in the future. So, so we take all of that research and we try to synthesize it in things to give out uh, to our clients. Uh, one of the things we're doing is trying to establish a library of details that can go between houses that have been developed. Each year we get new and better details, so we have to integrate those uh, into the houses. And then we provide those out um, to our housing providers, um, and we expect back, uh, you know, for them to uh, give us feedback about the specific challenges and opportunities of taking these models out into their service areas using their methods of delivery. So uh, we went from a pretty local project that was a, had a 25-mile radius to now a, a more regional uh, project in the southeast. So uh, this is an area we think that from a climactic sociocultural standpoint, the project still has some relevance. Um, so we do things that look like practice. We make construction documents. We try to make construction documents that talk not only about what to build, but how to build it and, and why it's built that way. So we, we do things about pointing out uh, features around efficiencies. Uh, and we also have instructions on how one could construct the house that were developed uh, working with our students, but knowing uh, that a lot of the groups we're working with also use volunteers and those not so, uh, as familiar with construction techniques. Um, and, and through this, I, I think what this project has allowed us to do is, is to try to better uh, get a handle on uh, where the transfer of knowledge of the project uh, in the project is and uh, how that goes tracks back and forth between the internal work of the studio and the external work of the Front Porch Initiative. And, and I think above and beyond the designs of the homes themselves, one of the things that working in a place over a period of time has allowed us to do is to make uh, invisible things visible. So things like our families frequently live in kinship networks and that offers a lot of resilience to them. And so when we think about moving people to a different place to give them, uh, you know, a better house, especially as we look at things like climate change and resilience uh, and, and coastal resiliency, there's, there's a lot tied up with where a person lives and the network they have around them that makes it a viable uh, situation for them. Uh, we also talk a lot about the differences between rural and urban. And that urban, you know, derives its value, a house in an urban area derives its value from the value uh, of the land on which it's built. Whereas in a rural situation, frequently it's more about um, having an asset that you can pass on to members of your family and how that grows wealth over time. So the house is a vessel to try to make these bigger systems uh, visible. Um, and then from the external side, we, you know, we're working externally with people who are doing financing on these homes. So trying to figure out things like um, how you make the home more affordable in terms of integrating how the house performs with how you evaluate someone for a mortgage. Um, so that, what's great about it is when we get these kind of challenges and questions back, uh, we can feed them back into the studio into two different places. And, and, and I think the, my big question to end with is that our number one mission is the education of students. So how can we create, continue to create opportunities for students to engage in a meaningful way in this research? And also how can we try to reflect all the missions of our university, whether it's learning, teaching, research, or outreach? Thank you. Unless I hear differently, I'm going to assume we got off to a little bit of a late start, so maybe we have 
10 minutes for questions? Yeah, all right, sounds good. And then there's a coffee break and then another session. All right, and so we'll probably be able to get ourselves back on time here. So um, let's see here in terms of... Great, okay, fantastic. So um, I'd like to turn over the crowd as soon as possible to see if there are any questions. There are microphones in front of you all here. Um, uh, but I do think, just as an observation, I think one of the things that was really interesting about the three papers altogether is that we had the uh, case study project from Chris that was part of a larger network of, uh, of projects that Ted was beginning to talk about and beginning to situate that within both a multi-university scenario plus a theoretical scenario and then we can see how some of these projects might begin to work themselves out into the public through the work that's going on with the front porch initiative uh, so three very different contexts for i think uh, uh, but a shared spirit amongst all of you to engage students in these important questions so um uh so again i did more of an observation about the uh, the relationship between between the three papers but i'd like to turn it over to the crowd and see if there are the, to the our guests here and see if there's any questions we can, Stephanie's got one. Thank you for those three um, wonderful papers. I have a question for Mackenzie. It seems like all day we've been hearing the word research, and as Joan pointed out, it's being fetishized. Everything's a lab now. All the design students are research. But what you showed to me seems to be one of the best models of the design studio and design build in particular being really activated as a research process, especially with the grad students doing something and then the third years coming back, always starting by looking at what's been done, carefully studying that. Um, and that is fascinating, but it also goes against the grain of a lot of architecture studios where students are taught, no, you, de you develop your concept and you kind of impose it on the client. So the design solution is emerging from a very different um, process. And I just wanted to hear your reflections on that and um, like, also how the students respond to that as a process of design and how you arrive at a solution. So it's, I think it's been an evolving process. Rural Studio is 26 now, and we've, we've done a lot of different things. I, I think that when, one of the things that was an interesting observation to me is that when we first started with the 20K house project, we kind of dropped some of the client work, um, or the you know the things that were more we called a client house. So we were still working with client, but they they were not as involved in the front process, the front end of the process. And then we got some pushback um, from that, uh, both from our students and kind of externally about what we were doing with the housing. So I think that having the third years back working from the very beginning with a client has been uh, interesting. We've also, I didn't talk about it today, but we also have fifth years that are working on client houses that are more specific to an individual and less prototype. So I, I think we're constantly trying to figure out where the balance is there. I, I know our students also think we do a lot of housing, um, but I think it's, a, it's just a really great scale to study something. And so I think that uh, it might be one of those things that when you reflect back on it later, uh, it's, it's more understandable why we've done that way. But it's a, it's a challenge uh, that we continue to try to work towards a system that's that's uh, suitable. You know, I think the other thing that we want to make sure we don't do is that uh, we don't want the students to be producing work for these housing providers. You know, they have other learning objecti objectives. So that it's not about kind of production and turning out models. Um, and that's the thing, I think, that as we move and try to decide what knowledge from ex externally feeds back into the studio, making sure that it's appropriate to our place and appropriate to the education of our students. Uh, thank you for your talks. I really enjoyed them. Uh, and I have, a, I guess, sort of a, a wonky grading question for Chris. Um, I really loved the absurdity of your very extensive collaborative evaluation grid. And you mentioned, you know, that students sort of hate it at first, but come to love it. And so I just wonder if you could expand on both the integration of that form of non-hierarchical collaborative evaluation, then also maybe talk about your categories a little bit. You sort of split up. You've, the value of the projects into value, RNO, and collaboration. So I wonder if you could say a little bit more about those buckets. Um, 
Yeah, it's, uh, I've, I've changed the, the criteria sometimes from project to project. And, uh, you know, responsibility and, and ownership is, um, you know, everybody has to own a part of the project. And um, so that really addresses their, uh, their ability to satisfy their responsibilities. Uh, the collaboration, you get people who just are, I think, resistant to, um, even though you're heading different initiatives, you've got to be talking and you've got to be sharing. And, and that's really become uh, an important mechanism because somebody may have great value, uh, the, the third category, uh, but they might not be sharing that or, or as, as readily and, and that hinders you know, the movement of, of the whole. Um, and I've, I think those three categories have, have worked uh, really well. And um, I guess they're, they're open to interpretation, you know, but this, the students have an understanding of, of those three categories. And those categories have evolved over time uh, working with, with the students. Um, I'm trying to think of what, I mean, there are a lot of insights that I, 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 I could add about that, that process. I, I first started that process because I needed to know what was going on. And then once I went through that process, I realized how good it was uh, for everybody because <laughs> I will package and um, edit um, all of the feedback that goes to every student. So all of the comments come in. I, I, I will uh, adjust some grammar. Uh, sometimes I'll take the expletives out. Sometimes I'll leave the expletives in, you know, thinking about how that person is going to uh, receive that information. Uh, I will say for the faculty feedback, a different student each time is responsible for collecting all of that information so it's anonymous. So I have, I, and, and they have to cleanse it so that if, if they think that you could, because if you're working with colleagues, I mean, you know who wrote something when you're, when you're supposed to be working in an anonymous capacity. Um, and so their responsibility is to, to cleanse that. So I don't know uh, what the feedback is. And I think that kind of anonymity uh, really, uh, the students take it quite, quite well. Um, at first, everybody starts off kind of warm and fuzzy. The tendency is like, we just want to support everybody. Uh, but then when the machine gets going, and, and reality, I mean, the gravity, the personalities, the budgets, the time constraints, all of that stuff heats up, they realize nobody can drop the ball. And, and there is a, there's a lot of empathy that goes into that too. There's a lot of encouragement when people are timid about putting their ideas forth. It's actually become a really great educational uh, tool well beyond my initial intention was I have no idea what's going on with this group of people. I'm responsible for everything, and I need to know. And it's it's really turned into this um, nice mechanism. And a number of my colleagues have kind of adopted the uh, uh, not for design build, but for other uh, kind of group engagement uh, studios. So, so I want to go back just a bit to the research question because I think that the. It's clear that there's content in what you're doing, right? It's in, and that it's obviously useful for, that students are learning something. But, and it is a but, when you submit for grants, it's a really useful thing to go through a series of questions. And I would ask, throw them out to all of you. For NSF, it's broader impact and intellectual merit. You have to answer those questions. And broader impact and intellectual merit force you to describe a method and the criteria that you're using to evaluate the outcomes and the results. For NIH, it's research aims. And, you know, they have, there's this very, I mean, I've done so many grants of both types, basically, at this point, more NSF, actually, but at this point, that it becomes second nature to think through the problem in terms of how you are actually, you know, what's my formative evaluation, right? What are my conclusions? What are my results? And for your projects, they're not quite there. I'm just... Right? That's that's what you're kind of. There's a sort of struggle. What is it? Where? What context does this really apply to? And how do I take what I'm doing and turn it over into a context where I can say, here's what we did. 
here's specifically what we did and how we're contributing to knowledge in a particular domain. And I think you, you the, I, I think it's there actually, but I think that it would be worth sort of pretending that you're going to submit or finding a program to submit to. Don't pretend. Go after a GERD. Go after, you know, a big NSF grant and figure out how to answer those questions. It's probably going to mean working with other people at the university, which is usually a really good thing, and it will force you to kind of confront those questions that I know tend to be a little fuzzy. But it's great work, so you should do it. The other one that's really useful for you guys is the EPA, by the way. The EPA has tons of grants for community development and engagement, basically. So you can, you're, you're doing work that matters, but you need to be able to frame it so that it's communicated so that it could get large scale funding. I just want to respond to that really quickly and say we actually we recognize it's something that we've not been very good at doing, and so we are actually working with our College of Education to do more of an assessment. And um, yeah, the and, and it's it's so that we can go more after those that's types of grants. I really that'd be so fantastic. So we're we're doing this already. There are these the the work is the result of large scale grants. So we've had four and a half million dollars worth of grants to support our work. So it's, it's a different model in Canada than down here. Not to say that what you're talking about isn't important. We have those criteria as well. But the field that we work in is called research creation. And research creation is a different has a different set of criteria. They have to be well explained, but it allows you to actually think while you're doing uh, it allows you to research and create simultaneously. And if I had to argue for extending the model in the US, it would be to kind of ad adopt this idea that is coming out of places like Canada, Australia, mm -hmm. Europe, where they're actually looking at how the creative fields work and do research. And the one thing that they're challenging is the the linear nature of establishing a project before you know what the project can produce. And the ability, in our case, it was a six-year project. We just had to report how we were doing. And they gave us, you know, they gave us carte blanche, basically. So I really appreciate that about our funding institutions. But it's, a, it's an important it was important to allow us to do what we did. I think we're running a little bit over time, but we have one patient question asker up cool. there. Thank you, uh, and thanks to each of y'all for your presentations. Um, our question's for Mackenzie as well. Um, thanks for years about Rural Studio particularly. I um, really admire y'all's work. But I'm curious, like thinking about the context of a predominantly white university in a very black, county in like the post Jim Crow South, but it looks like most of your students are white, most of your clients are black, so I'd like to hear a little bit about like those power dynamics and how you engage students to think about that. Yeah, I mean it's also something, you know, I think there's a lot of things that we could be better at, um, and I'm, I guarantee you that that is one of them. I think that uh, we, <laughs> when our students get out to West Alabama, and, and many of our students are from Alabama, and many of them have never been to that part of the state uh, before. So, you know, we kind of joke that it's like study abroad because it's, you know, even though it's in our state, it's not, this, you know. Um, but it's, 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 I think that One of the things we try we try to talk to our students about being respectful of the community. I'm struggling here because I don't have a good answer to give you, so I'm going to uh, muddle through it here. Um, uh, you know, I think we try to have our students be uh, very respectful of the community they're in and the resources that they're placing in the community and the value that has. So uh, Emily McGlon, who teaches our, th our third year uh, program, uh, she frequently talks about 
um, she, all with her students doing all of the study of her her, her client uh, their clients um, homes uh, she talks about the empathetic pencil and kind of drawing to understand um, and we you know we try to tr uh, we try to work with our clients knowing you know they're uh, presenting to them and getting their feedback I mean I think that's why it's really important to integrate the client back into our third year uh, program um, in particular and many of our third year pro uh, students go on to be our fifth year students and so they're working with an um, you know many of our community projects but I, I think we try to establish and um, that we don't have a right to build there. We work with clients and try to um, do the, we don't try to solve problems, we try to serve purposes. Um, and we try to also kind of find clients that, um, that are interested to work with us. So we're not trying to impose things. That, that continues on to our fifth year projects. I think there were a couple of years there where we've invented some things and we've really tried to steer away from that and develop things that are, are uh, from the community. Um, and I think we'll hopefully continue to get better um, at doing that. Okay, great. Thank you so much. We are uh, definitely over time, but uh, an interesting discussion. And, uh, um, and I think we'll be back here in just a few minutes, right? Yeah. Ten minutes. We're going to do a ten-minute break and come back. Thank you.